So thank you, Afua. Thank you, Dr. Cooper, for your important work and for suggesting that we bring tonight's uh, exceptional speaker, Dr. Wilde, to campus as part of this series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cooper to the stage. And please, Dr. Wilde. Thank you, Dr. Florizel. And thank you all for coming out tonight to the Belong Forum with Craig Stephen Wilder. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Wilder. And he is the Barton L. Weller Professor of History at MIT, which is the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in Boston, and a historian of American institutions and ideas. Dr. Wilder has published extensively on the history of race and culture in New York City, where he was raised and began his career as a community organizer in South Bronx. But perhaps Dr. Wilder is most well known for his recent work on race, slavery, and higher education in the United States. His 2013 book, Ebony and Ivy, Race, Slavery, and the Troubled History of America's Universities, opened the eyes of many with its exploration of the role of race and slavery in the development of some of America's most esteemed Ivy League colleges and universities. It is a powerful work of scholarship about a long overdue topic, a long overlooked topic, and it has rightfully won a number of awards and spurred on more critically important work in this area. Dr. Wilder's passion for shedding new light on history has been evident too through his work on public history projects and in major documentary films such as the Central Park Five. He also dedicates his time as a senior fellow at the Bard Prison Initiative, which gives prisoners the opportunity to earn college degrees during their incarceration in the New York State prison system. So as you can see, Dr. Wilder believes deeply in the power of education and we're thrilled that he's here tonight as part of this forum, which I hope will spark important conversation on our campus. Dr. Wilder will begin tonight's forum with a 30 to 35 minute talk, which will be followed by a question and answer period of about 15 minutes. So thank you again for being here and please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Wilder, Craig Stephen Wilder, to Halifax and to Dalhousie University. to turn my mic on and I almost forgot. So um, first, let me just thank President Florison um, for uh, this event and for the opportunity to actually be here tonight. Um, this is an extraordinary um, event to be invited to um, on your 200th anniversary and I'm quite honored and flattered that we, you would have me. Dr. Cooper, I want to thank you. Um, she was my introduction to Black Canadian history. I had to tell her today the first time we met. So. I've been reading her work for a really long time and just really enjoying it. And so thank you so much. Um, and then I want to apologize to the audience for having to reschedule this event to today. Um, they were very, very nice to me by not telling you why I had a passport problem, which is I could not find my passport, um, which until recently was not a problem, but is now a problem. <laughs> and Catherine Bagnall Styles, you could not have been nicer as I called you, mortified from Logan Airport and begged your forgiveness. So thank, thank you all very much. It's really great to be here. I'm going to be talking from an essay that's coming out relatively soon um, and on the topic of American universities, but looking at them at slightly different universities in the U.S. Um, during the revolutionary period. Give us a merchant acquainted with trade, the working men in Bristol, England, shouted in support of Henry Kruger, Jr., during a special election to fill a vacant seat in Parliament. Five years into a costly war uh, with the North American colonies, 
many Bristol citizens were actually tying their political and economic fates, their futures, to a North American slave trader. Slavers and planters had become, in fact, symbols of prosperity in Britain and America. Henry Kruger Jr. lost that 1781 special election, but he actually claimed the Bristol mayoralty later that year, and he reclaimed a, a seat in the House of Commons. The Kruger commercial network extended throughout the Atlantic world, from New York City to Britain, Jamaica, St. Croix, Curacao, and the West African coast. Kruger ships brought enslaved Africans to the Caribbean and the North American mainland. They supplied the West Indian plantations and the Southern plantations. They carried the products of enslaved labor to Europe um, and European goods into the colonies. Kruger had studied at King's College, now Columbia University in New York City, where his father and uncle were founding trustees. In 1739, his grandfather became the mayor of New York and his uncle claimed the mayoralty of New York City in 1757. In short, slave traders, planters, and land barons underwrote the institutional development of New York Colony, which one can see actually right through the experiences of the Kruger family. The elite established schools, libraries, churches, and hospitals, and they combined to govern all of those new institutions. Colonial academies were actually born in that economy, in that slave economy. And that economy expanded, funded the expansion of the educational infrastructure in the early years of the United States. Although established and governed to differing degrees by Christian denominations, Congregational, Anglican, Presbyterian, Baptist, Dutch Reform, German Reform, Methodist, Lutheran, and even Catholic, early colleges and academies were actually poorly supported. The governors of Harvard, founded in 1636 in Massachusetts, exploited the dense commercial networks that linked New England, the South, and the British Caribbean to Boston. Boston was, in fact, second only to London as a destination for people leaving Barbados, the most valuable of England's colonies. New England's ships circled in and out of the West Indies, where successive Harvard administrations also learned to um, launch campaigns for donations and students. While in Bridgeport, Barbados, a 1791, a 1709 graduate of Harvard, Thomas Prince, in fact, logged the continual arrival of ships from New England. And why? Well, in part, North America was a hostile environment for schools. In 1718, the trustees of uh, the Collegiate Institute, founded in 1701, now Yale, in New Haven, Connecticut, received a donation from the Welsh merchant Elihu Yale, 400 books, some cash, and a painting of George I. In return, they renamed the college for Yale. In 1722, they built a rector's house, basically by taking subscriptions, selling land, and getting the General Assembly of Connecticut to actually put a tax on rum imported from the West Indies. A year later, the Yale board, still looking for money, bestowed a medical degree upon Daniel Turner, and Turner was a respectable guild-licensed surgeon in London who lacked the academic credentials to join the Royal College of Physicians. It was the first medical degree ever offered in North America. Turner sent 25 books and a brief letter outlining, outlining his qualifications to New Haven. And at the September commencement, the trustees awarded him in absentia an honorary degree. Now, the only problem was Yale had no medical school. It had not a single science faculty. Um, and the Royal College ultimately declined to recognize those colonial credentials. But the actions of the Yale trustees were, in fact, not all that unusual. Um, from the establishment of Jamestown through the Civil War, Americans began several hundred academies, but 80% of them failed. Quote, small and as unknown as we are in respects to the great and famous universities which adorn the kingdoms of Great Britain, the trustees of Harvard wrote to the embattled King George I, before describing their institution as, quote, your Majesty's loyal and humble college in America. I like to point out that's the last time they ever expressed humility. Um, <laughs> but governors had little choice but to affirm such ties. For most of its four, first hundred years, Harvard actually did not have a single professor, but instead relied upon tutors for instruction. The presidents of colonial colleges lived like itinerants, spending much of the year journeying from town to town, hat in hand, begging, in fact, um, by taking you know, horses and rough coaches, um, asking for money province to province. They delivered sermons and academic addresses in churches and local associations, and frequently published those not, in fact, for the edification of the public, 
but actually simply to raise a little more money through their sale. The historian Frederick Rudolph neatly captured the hand-to-mouth realities of the colonial college. Quote, often when a college had a building, it had no students. If it had students, frequently it had no building. If it had either, then perhaps it had no money, perhaps no professors. If professors, then no president. If a president, then no professors. In 1724, the Reverend Hugh Jones complained that William and Mary, founded in 1693, 1691 in Virginia, had a seminary without a chapel, a college without scholarships, a library without books, and all under a president without a fixed salary. Seeking to solve his financial woes, President James Blair unsuccessfully promoted Virginia as, in fact, a place for repairing Bristol slave ships. Or to put it differently, if one thinks about that failure rate of American colleges in the colonial and early national period, another way of actually sort of capturing it is to just remember that no college established in British North America survived the colonial period without somehow attaching itself to the slave economy, either the slave trade or plantation slavery. In fact, higher education in the colonies ascended as the Atlantic slave trade peaked. In the decades before the American Revolution, slaving families like the Krugers transformed British North America. In the quarter century between 1745 and 1769, ministers, merchants, and land speculators organized seven new colleges in the British colonies. Or to think about that differently, until 1745, there were three colleges in British North America, Harvard, um, William and Mary, and Yale. In that 24-year period, less than a quarter century, the number of colleges more than triples to 10. Codrington College in Barbados, the College of New Jersey, now Princeton, um, the King's College, now Columbia, the College of Philadelphia, now the University of Pennsylvania, the College of Rhode Island, now Brown, Queens College, now Rutgers, and Dartmouth College in 1769 in New Hampshire. More schools, in fact, also meant more uh, competition for money. And to understand it, one has to understand two things. The Great Awakening actually created an incentive, the first Great Awakening, to really institutionalize the new denominations and the new movements in theology in universities. And the reaction of the old universities, Harvard and Yale in particular, to try and silence the evangelical impulse in the early 18th century created even more pressure to establish new universities through which evangelicalism and evangelical theology could get cultivated. But there was also another reason. The colonists attempting to claim regions by institution building. In the upper mid-Atlantic and New England, families whose incomes came from the slave trade and from provisioning the southern and Caribbean plantations financed these new schools. While in the lower mid-Atlantic, the south and the British West Indies, plantation families largely sponsored education. However, the integration of these slave economies increased intercolonial competition um, and uh, the, the sort of hunt for money. And I should say that 24-year period between the establishment of Codrington and the establishment of Dartmouth, where the number of colleges more than triples, that's in fact the exact moment when the Atlantic slave trade is peaking. The officers and trustees of northern schools knew that wealthy clients sat at the other end of the trade routes that brought fish, meat, produce, horses, wood, candles, rope, cloth, and human beings to the southern and Caribbean plantations. Quote, whereas the draft of several letters had been prepared to be transmitted to the several West India Islands by a committee, began the minutes of a, the October 1759 meeting of the trustees of King's College, now Columbia, with a board which largely comprised merchants and had a significant number of slave traders, launched its first Caribbean fundraising campaign before the college had a building or a student. Um, Hezekiah Smith did the same for Brown, and one can actually follow um, that whole pattern of turning to the Caribbean and using, in fact, the commercial relationships of the northern colonies, the New England colonies, and the mid-Atlantic colonies to generate funds for schools um, and to find students. The wealth of traders, planters, and landowners raised the prospects of American academies and colleges. New York's merchants were so, in fact, ambitious that they designed a grand campus for King's College to display their wealth and the city's growing prestige, at least the prestige they had in their minds. Their vision for the college differs significantly from the first president, Samuel Johnson, um, who called his board, excuse me, who called his board a gang of dullards who had managed to elevate the aesthetic over the academic. Quote, our building now finished has cost so much that I have not seen how we shall have stock enough to provide sufficient salaries. 
Reverend Johnson complained to the Archbishop of Canterbury only four years after the college was charged. Faced with escalating costs, President Johnson protested that he had, quote, done all that I can do to save it from the trustees, by the way, and begged Providence to protect his college from its governors. The wealth generated in Atlantic slavery, in fact, swelled, rightly or wrongly, the confidence of many boards. When it opened in New Jersey, Nassau Hall, the, the nucleus of the College of New Jersey, now Princeton, was the largest building in British North America, a monument to its merchant benefactors. It stood three stories tall, housed nearly 150 students, and included a library, chapel, dining halls, and a meeting room. The Reverend Eliezer Wheelock, the founder of Dartmouth College, planned Dartmouth Hall as the focal point of his campus, located on a small hill and topped by a couple of weather vane to balance out the surrounding terrain. The economic networks of Atlantic slavery also brought flows of students onto campus. Thomas Martin, a graduate of the College of New Jersey, tutored the white children at the Madison's family's uh, Montpelier Plantation in Virginia. In the summer of 1769, young James Madison, the future president of the United States, arrived in Princeton on horseback, attended by his slave, Sonny. In 1771, Nicholas Kruger, the slave trader, and a small group of traders and planters from St. Croix sent the 16-year-old Alexander Hamilton to study at Elizabethtown Academy in New Jersey to prepare him for entrance into college. Um, he was a scholarship student, and they had actually decided that he was talented enough to warrant this. And we should remember the other thing that happens. Um, he studies at Elizabethtown, the prep school, and then is sent to King's College, now Columbia. And um, the Cougars pay his tuition at King's College by sending barrels of rum up from the Caribbean um, to actually finance his education. In May 1733, I'm sorry, 1773, John Jackie Custis moved into a suite at King's College, now Columbia, with his slave, Joe. General George Washington had escorted his stepson to New York City. His stepson was the wealthiest person in Virginia. And, president, and uh, the president of King's College, Miles Cooper, and the faculty bent over backwards to welcome the young aristocrat, make ties to the Southern planter class, and earn the general's favor. Schools offered, in fact, these kinds of indulgences to solve real problems. Despite the enthusiasm of the trustees and some of the donors, in, um, 18th century campuses remained rude, libraries were mean, and study areas lacked basic teaching materials. Most early colleges had a single main building that housed, in fact, virtually everything. Challenged by the proliferation of schools in the North um, and the aggressive recruiting of Northern schools in the South and the West Indies, William and Mary actually had a hard time staying solvent and even attracting students from the immediate Williamsburg area. Quote, the college makes a very agreeable appearance, Josiah Quincy Jr. wrote upon entering Williamsburg on the eve of the American Revolution, but once one got past the lovely gardens and into the buildings, he was troubled to discover that William and Mary was in, I'll quote again, a very declining state. The American Revolution brought greater stress, which I don't have to tell people in Canada. Given the failed invasion of Quebec in 1775, Yes, we do recognize that. We actually teach it um, you know, um, on off days. We teach it. <laughs> so, le leap years, we, we point that out. Given the failed invasion of Quebec, and then the equally disastrous diplomatic mission that we launched afterwards um, with Catholics from Maryland who weren't allowed to vote, um, representing the United States, which, you know, problem number three, um, you, you already know that the American Revolution brought greater stress. If the British electorate suffered, in fact, economic dislocations with the North American Rebellion, people in the colonies endured, in fact, shortages of goods, military occupations, confiscations of property, and an unraveling economy and armed warfare. The United States government also sought alliances that fundamentally transformed the United States. Um, foreign alliances that brought Catholic soldiers onto American soil. No small concession for historically anti-Catholic people. In 1778, France recognized the United States and America's ambassadors to France and, and its allies were soon pressuring Louis XVI to send troops to the United States. Spain secretly supplied the American uprising through the Mississippi Corridor and in 1779 declared a war of sympathy on England. 
quote, we have lived to see perilous times in our once happy and peaceful country, times which more or less affect us all in a very uncommon manner, lamented James Manning, the first president of the College of Rhode Island, now Brown, and a graduate of the Princeton College. Manning spent much of the war worrying about his campus and its facilities and about the future of his college. This town, and I'm quoting him again, has been in garrison ever since the troops came to Newport and the college which is converted into barracks and the adjoining land has severely felt the effects of war. The benefits of campuses were actually apparent to generals on both sides of the conflict. Quote, it is not possible to have our troops winter in North America, a French intelligence report cautioned. There is not a military barrack on the continent or an edifice where the troops could be placed and kept under proper mi military discipline. Complete with furnished living quarters, servants' facilities, additional rooms and offices, large kitchens, supplies of water, and often farms. Colleges were of obvious value to generals looking to quarter troops and organized military operations. Their strategic locations in port cities and along accessible roads in the interior also made them attractive. Weeks before Christmas 1776, American forces seized the College of Rhode Island, now Brown, and remained for three years. When they finally departed in 1780, French soldiers took the campus and turned it into a military hospital. Several colleges actually folded during the war and just ceased operation. Um, Harvard actually sought to relocate itself into, and I'll eventually catch up with my own slides. Um, <laughs> Harvard actually managed to relocate and basically relocated to Concord, Massachusetts. It moved into the interior. Yale moved north from New Haven. They hid the college bell. They gave the treasury reports to um, an officer to hide. And they moved the whole college to a couple of towns up by Hartford um, into the interior. But the other thing that's important about what they did is they actually didn't just move away from the coast. They moved to the places in Connecticut and Massachusetts in these two cases. Where that had um, some of the greatest concentrations of slaveholders. In other words, um, the colleges survived the war by actually embracing slavery, uh, by turning to it, and by using enslaved people to actually help secure the campus and allow them to reorganize operations quickly um, and with the kind of service that they needed and expected. Few officers were probably in as uncomfortable a position as Eliezer Wheelock um, who found himself on the opposite side of a war with his primary benefactor, um, Governor John Wentworth and the Earl of Dartmouth. At Whitehall, Lord Dartmouth was maneuvering to contain the colonial uprising, while um, Wheelock, Reverend Wheelock, was attempting to sell his school as a strategic location for the American cause where um, he could use his uh, proximity and his long relationship to Native American nations to help actually um, keep those native nations from siding with the British. New England was invaded. Matters were worse in the Mid-Atlantic. King's College's new president actually disappeared um, because he was a Tory, an Anglican, and a Royalist. He fled to England. The British invasion and occupation of New York um, meant that the entire campus was turned over to military operations. The trustees were actually reduced to meeting in a tavern at one point. And in May 1777, they described their predicament, quote, many of the governors being in England, General Oliver Delancey and Colonel John Cougar in the field leading regiments loyal to George III, and several Tories, and I'll quote again, in the power of the rebels and unable to come to town, they couldn't actually even get a quorum to vote. Um, a year later, they were actually meeting in a Manhattan tavern um, and had largely given up on the project of reorganizing the college. Philadelphia and Princeton were actually in chaos, and one can actually go through this over and over again. I, I won't for too long. Um, but as the war came to campus, the campuses also went to war. Alexander Hamilton left King's College and took a commission in the Colonial Army. Simeon DeWitt, the only graduate of the 1776 class of uh, what's now Rutgers, then Queens College, was promoted to chief geographer in the American Army. Louis Vincent, one of Eliezer Wheelock's Native American students at Dartmouth, served as a scout and interpreter. John Wheelock, his son, actually went to war as an officer. The, the Wheelocks actually ran Dartmouth as kind of a family business, what um, we would today call a for-profit college um, through its early decades. Um, after his resignation, President Daggett of Yale joined several students and townspeople trying to resist the British invasion. Much of that was um, to, with no great success. 
or to put it differently, higher education in the United States suffered, in fact, an extraordinary defeat during the war. The campuses were largely uprooted, um, classes were suspended, students were dispersed, the faculty actually joined, faculty members joined the military as a lot of students did. Um, they went back to their homes, and then they came back to a war, at the end of the war, campuses that um, were in no condition um, to restart any educational enterprise. The war left almost all the campuses damaged or in ruins, perhaps except Dartmouth, which didn't really suffer any damage because no one can get there. But what was striking to me about this story is actually not that the colleges were damaged. That's actually kind of a given. That's obvious. What was most striking to me is that none of the colleges that went into the war failed after the war, despite that extraordinarily high failure rate of American colleges in the colonial and early or the antebellum era. In fact, actually, the opposite happened. The uh, um, United States universities go through an extraordinary period of expansion right after the American Revolution. Despite, in fact, the debts, despite the destruction, despite the absence of, in fact, organized government in many parts, Americans founded 18 new colleges between the end of the Revolution and the beginning of the new century. Uh, on average, one college per year. To put it differently, if the number of colleges tripled between 1745 and 1769, they triple again in the 17 years after the um, American Revolution. Two-thirds of those new schools were in the plantations of the South and the lower mid-Atlantic, where before the war there had only been one college, William and Mary. Colleges promised multiple things, to unify the American people, protect young Republicans from the corrupting influence of European schools, and level the regional inequities of the new nation. The Presbyterians broke ground on seven new schools. In fact, the Presbyterians, although only the third largest denomination, build more schools in, antebellum, in the antebellum United States than any other denomination. The Episcopalians raised three colleges in the South, North Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, charter public universities. And shortly after the war, Father John Carroll called his fellow priests to the White Marsh Slave Plantation in Maryland, where they organized a new governing body for the Catholic Church. If you remember again, the um, alliances with Spain and France actually have a consequence in the United States, and the consequence is the decriminalization of Catholics. At the White Marsh Plantation, the, um, the small group of priests in the United States actually organized a corporation of Roman Catholic clergy, and the corporation actually takes um, charge over the old Jesuit slave plantations, the five major plantations and the smaller properties in Maryland um, that reached from the southern border with Virginia to the northern border with Delaware. College governor's initial challenge was rebuilding. On November 8, 1783, before the defeated British Army had finished evacuating from New York City, James Manning sat down at, the reclaimed, at his desk in the reclaimed College of New Jersey, I'm sorry, College of Rhode Island, Brown, and wrote several pleas to wealthy Baptists. In a tone more desperate than brazen, the president stressed the unity of the Baptist communion above the obvious barrier of what he, I'll quote him, our independence. Manning now prayed that the two nations would become firm allies in the future and suggested that the progress of the Baptist communion is more important than any slights or injuries that ha had happened during the war. He sweetened the appeal by promising to rename the college after a major benefactor, preferably but not necessarily a Baptist. Quote, can you find no gentleman of fortune among you who wish to rear a lasting monument to his honor in America? He wrote to the Reverend John Wyland. The college already had, and I'll quote him again, an elegant edifice which awaits for the name of some distinguished benefactor. In his letter to the Welsh classicist Thomas Llewellyn, Manning listed the British sponsors who had already endowed professorships and colleges in the United States, and added how pleased he would be to hear, see, and speak the name Llewellyn College throughout New England. In fact, what the Americans end up doing is something really quite bizarre, like Manning did. They start turning to England and asking for money to rebuild their colleges after the American Revolution. Um, and letter after letter, the, the Presbyterians launch a campaign, the Anglicans out of New York or the Episcopalians out of New York launch a campaign, um, and they in fact find few friends in Britain. And their allies in France were spiraling into financial crisis, because, precisely because they had supported the American Rebellion. Um, they begin using Thomas Jefferson in France as the French minister 
to make appeals to the court there. Not every Republican was canvassing the European courts for money, however. And this is my favorite of them, so I'll just use him. College officers did not have to wait for Louis to be dragged to the guillotine to know that American institutions had to fend for themselves. President Jacob Hardenberg concluded the 1787 commencement at uh, Queens College, now Rutgers, with an unusual if honest call to self-reliance. A native Dutch speaker, in fact, the Hardenberg family is the family that owns Sojourner Truth. If you know the history of the abolition of Sojourner Truth, they're actually the family that owns her um, in the early part of her life. A native Dutch speaker, Hardenberg began by apologizing for his difficulties with English. This showed, in fact, extraordinary rhetorical skill in hammering his audience on the importance of generosity. Thanking the families who had already donated, he cautioned those who had yet to give, quote, has kind heaven blessed any of your sons with more than an ordinary genius? The minister bluntly asked, and then concluded for them that the liberal support of academies remained parents' best insurance against the stinginess of nature. Despite, or perhaps because of those kinds of appeals, the college ceased operation from 1795 to 1807. In fact, Atlantic slavery ultimately is what transforms the fate of the American college, and one can see it with the first Catholic college in the United States. In 1789, the very year that, that um, the year after the Constitution is ratified and George Washington um, is inaugurated, Pope Pius VI appoints um, John Carroll as the first Catholic bishop of the United States. That same year, Carroll presided over the founding of Georgetown College, with the, which the Catholic priest decided um, to place in the heart of American power the region of Maryland that had been ceded for the federal district, which is why um, Georgetown is in Georgetown. The Catholic clergy had taken control of the old Jesuit slave plantations. The regulations of the college now gave the vice president responsibility for overseeing college servants, and the officers and faculty regularly used slaves on campus, and the Catholic clergy even sold slaves off the plantations to fund the college. To put it differently, the post-war United States, the expansion of higher education after the war, was a consequence of the restoration of Atlantic slavery. James Manning ultimately found, in fact, someone to help rescue the College of Rhode Island Brown, but it wasn't a Baptist from England. It was the Brown family, the slave trading family from Rhode Island. As the fate of colonial slave traders and colonial planters, the fates improved, the fates of the American colleges improved. College leaders turned their attention back to the plantations. As um, the Reverend John Witherspoon of New, of New Jersey put it, now Princeton, the fate of the College of New Jersey would not rest upon Europeans, but upon, upon maintaining, quote, the great concourse of gentlemen's sons, some from the West Indies and from, some from the southward. Boys from the south and the West Indies traveled to northern schools, and over and over again, one can actually see the power of Atlantic slavery in establishing higher education and higher education revolution that happens in the United States right after the war. At Georgetown, you can see it perfectly. Not only did the plantations fund the university and the Catholic missions, but it, there's another relationship between Georgetown and Atlantic slavery which is important in this part of the history of American higher education. The unraveling of the French Empire allows, in fact, the Catholic Church in the United States to establish itself as a church with a national presence. Among, in fact, the first presidents of Georgetown, the Reverend Louis Guillaume Valentin de Bourg, a refugee from the revolution in Saint-Domingue, now Haiti, who had come to Maryland to escape the revolution, became, in fact, one of the, first, the third president of um, uh, Georgetown. In fact, Georgetown is the only university that actually has, in the colonial period, two Haitian presidents. Um, in the, not in the colonial period, in the period before the American um, Civil War. It was likely, in fact, the most diverse college campus in the early nation. Um, the college's first classes included students from Saint-Domingue, Cuba, Santo Domingo, Guadalupe, Martinique, and St. Lucia. But in fact, actually, it's a college created by the unraveling of the French Empire in the Atlantic world, which allows the Catholic Church in the United States, particularly after the Louisiana Purchase, to establish itself as, in fact, um, more than just a regional church and turn itself into a national church. Agreed, and I'm quoting, that Mr. Oh, sorry. Sure, I'm just, yeah. Um, 
agreed that Mr. Yuzal Ogden be empowered to sell the Negro man James given by Mr. Watts for as much money as he will sell for. The trustees of Newark Academy resolved at their March 9, 1795 meeting. A New Jersey alum and a slave owner, Yuzal Ogden, ministered at Trinity Church in Newark, and lots of the trustees, um, in fact, of the Newark Academy had relationships to the Mid-Atlantic colleges. They had actually tried to raise money in other ways, but Newark was destroyed during the war by British forces who were trace, uh, chasing George Washington through New Jersey after the uh, Battle of Long Island, right, after the American army fails to stop them at Long Island. In May 1795, the board voted to, quote, sell the Negro man James, a donation to the academy, to Moses Ogden, a trustee and the brother of Yuzal, who promised to pay 40 pounds within two months. The money was actually used to finish the roof on the building. Slaveholding patrons like Thomas, I'm sorry, Stephen Van Rensselaer and Henry Rutgers ultimately saved Queens College. Slave trading families like the Browns saved um, the College of Rhode Island, now, now Brown University. As slaveholding receded from the northern states, and as the United States approached the end to its involvement in the slave trade, college presidents and trustees forged new ties to Atlantic slavery. For me, uh, looking into this period, one of the things I was struck by was that in many ways, the, the ending of the American Revolution is actually as important in the story of the relationship between American slavery and American colleges as the, or, the origins of these colleges in the colonial slave trade and plantation slavery. Because after the American Revolution, to rescue themselves, American colleges actually doubled down on the relationship to slavery. They reaffirmed it. They turned to slavery and the slave trade, and they tied their fates directly to the Atlantic slave economy. If the economy succeeded, they would succeed. If the economy failed, they would fail. But that's the bargain that they made. And part of the price that they paid in that bargain, the additional price that they paid in that bargain, was they also became, in fact, the primary defenders of Atlantic slavery. In 1818, the Reverend Charles Van Quickenborn and a group of Belgian Jesuits and their slaves established St. Louis University, the first college west of the Mississippi River. And the brief story of the American college expansion westward is that the Presbyterians bring the American college to the banks of the Mississippi River, and the Catholics actually bring it across that river. It was about the same time that sugar refiners in places like New York and Brooklyn and textile manufacturers, cotton textile manufacturers in New England, began funding engineering and technical colleges in the Northeast, like MIT, to service the mills and the plants that were using the products of slavery to launch an industrial revolution. Legislative and judicial actions to end slavery in the North lived, in fact, as continual reminders of the importance of Atlantic slavery to the nation. And American colleges embraced that contradiction to find funds, to recruit students, and to protect the flows of money and scholars by dispatching their graduates to staff the slave regimes of the Atlantic world and to build the primary intellectual and moral defenses of Atlantic slavery. Thank you. Main advantage that you'll school off student here at Dowsey. Just want to say I'm Dr. Evan here. I think your knowledge and scholarship here is very important for everyone here in the audience. It gives us something truly to think about when we look forward to Dowsey University's next 200 years. More importantly, it gives an active representation to race and slavery in the university as well, in the South as well as the North. On behalf of Dowsey, I have a small little gift for you. Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, we move into our moderated session. We are uh, joined here with Tom Murphy, and Tom Murphy is currently in CBC News anchor. Uh, he has covered major stories during his years as a broadcaster and has been recognized and achieved awards, including the RTNDA Award for a TV short feature, and as well, Columbia's International Film and Television Festival. So ladies and gentlemen, give him a round of applause and join him to the stage, Tom Murphy.
give it. Well, that was a real pleasure oh, to you. listen to that. That's very uh, interesting, and um, I'm struck by it, as, I, as I'm sure many here are. We, we recognize the names, the edifice of some of the buildings, you know, Princeton, Yale, and, and to hear the stories behind some of those institutions, really quite something. I know there's going to be some questions in the room, and we are going to have people, uh, these two people right here, actually, we're going to have microphones, and we really do encourage to get a conversation going here, as we say we don't have a whole lot of time, so I want to quickly get some questions for you, so don't be shy at all. Because I'm standing next to you, I get to ask you the first question. How's sure. that? That's fine. Yeah. I was struck by listening to some of that here. Uh, listening to you, a man who had dedicated so much of his life to higher education and to some of the work in some of these institutions. What's it like for you? What was it like for you when you were researching some of these things and discovering, unearthing some of these truths? Well, um... <laughs> I think the, the most honest answer is, and I'll just speak personally, as a, um, as a black person who went to an undergraduate college that was in part funded by the sale of 272 people, um, the Jesuits sell 272 people um, from the Maryland plantations to Louisiana in 1838. Um, and the money is used to pay down the debts of Georgetown, and, and, um, but it's also used to finance the expansion of the Catholic Church North which includes the founding of the first Catholic University in New York, Fordham, where I went, and the first Catholic University in New England, um, Holy Cross. So as a black person who, um, as, and as you know, someone born and raised Catholic, um, who went to a university with that history and then went to graduate school at Columbia University founded by slave traders, um, one of the reactions I had to it is that it changed the way I thought about my education. Um, it didn't make me less grateful for that education, or less, you know, um, um, so it didn't change my embrace of that education. Um, but it actually did change my sense of um, my right to that education. Um, and so I'll get rid of the word grateful for a minute because that's probably what was lost. Um, gratitude was no longer, in fact, the medium. Um, and it was really more about just sort of the rightness of um, our access to these institutions and the rightness of creating, in fact, really quite democratic access to higher education. Um, and so the story made me think about my own history differently. It made me realize that I always had that right to be educated. Um, and yeah. No, that's okay, very good. Uh, very well put indeed. And as I encourage people to come to the microphone here, and again, don't be shy. And if you want the microphone to come to you, maybe that can happen as well. I see a gentleman there with his hand up very quickly there. Before we get to that question, and while we, while we uh, get him lined up at the microphone, how, how are your writings, your speeches, your, your story accepted when you go or when, when you're being quoted at some of these institutions? Tell me about that. I think the reception has been generally good, but I think we also have a way of insulating ourselves from history. Um, you know, we have a, a, an ability to accept historical facts while denying historical the the, um, the obligations that are a consequence of those facts. Right? Um, and so I, I think in some ways what happens and what I try to fight against is looking at history simply as um, a set of facts and details without really thinking about what the um, what consequences flow from what we're now coming to understand about our past. And so it's important to look at our past as honestly and as openly as we can, and it's equally important to think about what are the moral consequences that actually flow from reconsidering our past and reconsidering the false narratives that we had told ourselves and took such comfort in. Okay, interesting point. Okay, I think we do have a question. Is that right? We had a hand up there, right there. Who wants, who wants to go first? Let's just down over here, I think, was first, yeah. With somebody waiting on the decks here on the second row. Okay, so uh, your question. Hi. Uh, so I've got uh, sort of two questions. Uh, the first one is in regards to uh, a quota system. So that's an idea that a lot of people float around in regards to alleviating like the, the gaps between race and education. So I wanted to know your opinion. Being a, a black American, and obviously you've succeeded tremendously in your education. I mean, do you feel that that is 
realistic um, perhaps option for countries or cities or whatever to take in order to alleviate the gap between race and education. Uh, my second question is about um, free education here in North America, in Canada and the States. Um, here, a lot of countries, for example, in Europe, they've got free education for all their citizens, but Canada and the States, who have considerable resources and I'm sure have the ability to provide that for their citizens, do you think that that is something that needs to be brought into the forefront, or is it something that's sort of rooted into the system where um, higher education is something that people will always pay for forever, or is that something that's going to change? And if so, when and what's the realistic time frame for that? That's, the last one is a really good question. Uh, Stephen, do you want to take that? The, um, the last question. Um, well, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah, the, the, yeah. Two, the two questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, uh, yeah. Um, free education, absolutely. I'm in. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, public universities in the United States should be free. They once were, uh, for the most part, free. Um, and so I'm, I'm perfectly in on free education. I have no problem with that. I also think that we have to do serious things to level the inequities between universities and to keep a small group of extraordinarily wealthy universities from shaping the political economy of higher education in ways that are fundamentally undemocratic and unjust. Um, the question on quotas, it depends on, you know, there are multiple different kinds of quota systems. Um, I, I have an easier answer for that, um, is education should be free, higher education should be accessible, um, and the gaps between um, institutions of higher education need to be closed. Um, we need to engage, in fact, I, I think elite universities have an obligation to engage in random, regular, and reckless acts of social justice. Um, we should be engaged in the work of changing the communities around us. Um, MIT, uh, in exchange for its resources, and I, I, I love my job at MIT, in exchange for the resources that we have and the access that we have, um, we should actually impose upon ourselves the burden to transform the world, not just through technology, but through the day-to-day -day actions that we demonstrate and that we model in Cambridge, in Boston, and in that greater area. We have the capacity to actually be transformative. We just don't have the courage to do it very often. So, so just to follow up on that, uh, what do you feel is like the main sort of like impeding factor towards like something like free education? Do you feel it's more sort of like political hierarchy that's responsible for that? Or what do you think is the sole reason to like something like that? Because Canada as a country is incredibly wealthy, I'm sure. Right. the money's there where they can facilitate for every single citizen to attain higher education. I think, you know, you look at a country like Cuba, if you believe, you know, the news that's propagated here, they're not exactly wealthy, but they have free education for every single one of their citizens. So, I mean, I'll, I'll, do you talk, think I'll speak more about the United States than Canada, because I actually know it better. Um, and um, I have the standing to do it. Uh, the, you know, look, I, I think there are multiple barriers to free education. One is just the political structure of the United States um, and its entrenched conservatism. The other is the fracturing of um, uh, democratic politics in the United States and, um, and the sort of the fractioning of the discourse around the importance of education. And a final one is actually the um, extraordinary burdens and um, pain. Um, being experienced by working class people in the United States, the disintegration of unions, the disintegration of civil rights organizations, so that, um, or the decline of them, um, that those are in fact all impediments to the kinds of social movements that allow you to achieve, um, and that would actually create the constituency for achieving free education. But this is actually something that a lot of us work on. I've got colleagues who are working on the campaign for free higher education in the United States. There are different models of it. I've got colleagues who are work, working on reparations in the United States, and there are different models of that. And I, I, I favor both of those objectives. Um, I, I absolutely favor both of those objectives. And what, if I want to personalize it just a bit, you know, I grew up in the you know, inner city in the United States to, um, you know, a mother who raised three children by herself and worked her way off of welfare to get her high school diploma and to find a job with New York City. And what's criminally frightening to me today is that if you're born in that same neighborhood today, it's actually probably harder to make the journey out of poverty to a college than it was when I was a kid, which is just a, an embarrassment um, and a disgrace nationally. Yeah. Okay, we have a question in the second row here, sir. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, I guess my uh, uh, 
question is about this idea of kind of what does it look like to reconcile the past that you've been so uh, eloquent about speaking uh, to tonight with the idea that this 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 current uh, situation, the current situation of inequity that we find ourselves in higher education today, um, where we haven't, in some ways, we haven't moved beyond where we were in, um, in, in the past. Um, so uh, Drew Koch, uh, who I'm not sure if you know, but he's a historian in the US, um, president of the John Gardner Institute, wrote a story, or wrote an article in the American Historical Association newsletter called Many Thousands Failed where he looked at survey history courses in across the U.S., uh, um, multiple different institutions, and looked at the, the proportion of students who were actually getting either a D or an F or withdrawing from those survey history courses. And the proportion of those students who were either black or indigenous was significantly different than, than the rest of the population attending a higher education. And so he was trying to make the case that you know, we have a fundamental duty to change our curriculum today to address the inequities rather than just trying to reconcile with the, the, the past. And so I was wondering if you could speak to that and maybe what MIT is doing around that. So, I, I mean, I can put it in, a different, in different terms. You know, MIT has an MIT and slavery project that we launched just in the fall. It began last summer and the project really launched in the fall of 2017. And one of the things that we did in the project was um, to establish as an aim of the project that the history of the relationship between MIT and slavery and the broader relationship between science, engineering, and slavery um, that we're investigating and that we're making public actually has to be incorporated into the way that MIT actually presents itself. Right? So it's not there to just be on the MIT and slavery website. It's being produced to change the way that the institution actually presents itself publicly that the story of slavery should become so ordinary on our campus. The story of um, the, uh, the Native American history and African American history should become so, so ordinary um, as aspects of both the visual culture and the rhetorical um, cultures of our campuses that they're no longer shocking. The only reason we're shocked that MIT has a relationship to slavery is that we've been so successful at hiding that relationship. Um, and, you know, and so I think we absolutely have an obligation to look at the um, curriculum. And, um, you know, but I, I think there are multiple repairs that have to happen to the way that we engage and use the past. Um, and we can't be shocked at the um, horrific consequences of the erasure and silencing of um, minority populations in the histories of the United States and Canada. We can't be shocked that there are actually outrageous consequences to, to that in the sort of the outrageous social consequences that we still deal with today. It's, you know, I think it's actually just simply you know, naive and hypocritical of us to pretend that uh, people with our history um, and our intensely hostile relationship to our own past um, would not have, in fact, consequences. There wouldn't be negative consequences. Uh, any other questions? We have one up back there. Uh, Ms. Flutter? Uh, hi. Yeah, I got a question that kind of relates more to the talk you gave there. Um, so the majority of those schools seem to be more uh, northern schools, situated in north of the northern part of the United States. Uh, so come the time the Civil War was, uh, was around, was it the more southern states that tied themselves even closer to slavery? Did they have more issues? Uh, after after the war, uh, creating the funds to continue the school. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a there are multiple histories to the United States College, and so after the revolution, in fact, the real expansion of higher education is in the South. Um, and as cotton culture develops, and cotton becomes, in fact, the cornerstone of the United States economy in the decades before the Civil War. If you think about it, on um, the eve of the American Civil War, sixty percent of all U.S. exports are cotton. Right? That's how important cotton by itself is to that economy. Right? Um, and when you add in the other products of slavery, sugar, rice, um, hemp, indigo, um, you're talking about, in fact, you know, slavery as the foundation of the American economy. In the decades before the war, in fact, the higher education expansion had largely been in the South. And um, both European and Northern academics headed South for their professional development. Um, you know, Frederick Barnard, who becomes the president of Columbia after the war, um, had his start in administration as the president of the University of Alabama and the University of Mississippi, where he was also a slaveholder. Um, and you can find lots of northern academics and European academics who head south because 
the money from the cotton economy is funding yet another revolution in higher education, which is largely Southern. After the war, um, a lot of Southern colleges find themselves in great crises. Northern colleges do too. But I should say, remember that when slavery ends in the Northern states, that doesn't end the relationship between Northern universities and slavery. They actually tra chase those sources of funds into the South and into the West Indies right up until the eve of the war. Thanks. I kind of have another one here, if, if I can go for sure, it. Yeah. Um, sure. So we look, we can look, we look back at these, and we, you know, it's all it's terrible things, and we can, uh, you know, we we all feel fairly awful about it. But how how can we act today so that we can look back at what we've done in the past and not have that same feeling? What what are little things that people can do in their lives? Sure. I, I mean, I I think you you probably already know because you asked that question. And the, and the person who asked, ask, you know, the person who asked that question is already thinking about the world in ways that actually um, I applaud. Um, and so, I, in part, I think you already know. But, it, but one of the things I think is important about our histories is that our histories actually get us to think about the past, but they also get us to think about the present. Um, in the, one of the earlier meetings, I was saying, you know, the conversations that we have on campus actually matter to our students. Um, I learned a long time ago, and I'll, I'll just repeat something I said to a group earlier. Um, I learned a long time ago when I became a college professor that I was doing a disservice to my students because I often, in fact, uh, or I didn't as a habit, talk about my own background very much. I had learned in college and in graduate school that historically white colleges and historically white graduate school um, that I shouldn't talk about my background because it actually tended to disrupt my fellow classmates' sense of meritocracy. But they like to believe that we all arrived in the same way. Um, and they didn't like having that unsettled. And so I just kind of flattened out my experiences. And I just, but when I do that as a faculty member, I eliminate the space for my students' differences. Um, if I don't actually talk about poverty, I, I silence students who are poor. Um, I silence students who are coming from very different backgrounds. Um, and part of, I think part of the obligation of being a faculty member, part of the obligation of being a staff member and an administrator is actually creating the spaces for our students to be three-dimensional people. Um, and we do that by modeling, in fact, what's um, not just what we, um, our own experiences, but by creating, in fact, the freedom to be truly three-dimensional. Um, and you know, we have a lot of power over that and a lot of control over it. And so looking at the past is also a way, in the same vein, of opening up conversations about what we are and what we do right now. What kind of institution do we want to be in the 21st century world? What kind of legacy do we want to leave to the next century and to future generations? And looking at the past, looking at our history with slavery, is a way of actually forcing ourselves to also think about, for instance, labor conditions on our campuses today, the, um, the way in which um, in United States universities, the rise of the sort of neoliberal university um, with its very sort of draconian um, labor and employment practices, that it implicates all of those things and it opens up the possibility of having very different kinds of conversations on our campuses in which people who aren't the usual suspects are actually brought into the discussion. Um, and it, you know, I want my students thinking about who, who actually you know, cleans the spaces that we live in um, and who prepares the food that we eat um, and does all of those other sort of hidden services for us and if history is a way of opening up that conversation, then I say let's do a lot of history. I'll maybe Thank you. wrap up with a, with a question here, just to follow up on that a little bit. You talked a bit earlier about the importance of being honest about our history. Do you think people are prepared to be more honest now? Um, are, they ready to have, are we ready to have the, we're having the conversation here at Dell yeah. tonight? Is that your sense, General? I, I think yes and no. Yeah, I think we've learned to use and to react to history a little bit differently. Um, and so if you look across the United States and Canada, you can actually see all sorts of evidence um, that we um, are open to historical conversations that we were not comfortable with 20 or 25 years ago. Um, you can see it in the popular culture, you can see it in film, you can see it in television. But, but we have also learned at the same time to distance ourselves from the consequences of engaging that past in very real ways. We've created a comfort that there won't be requirements placed upon us by that past. And I think one of the reasons, for example, that you know, there is some backlash um, against universities that begin exploring their history with slavery um, and their histories with race and racial injustice is that, to be perfectly honest, we get very uncomfortable with any conversation 
that seems to empower black people to make claims upon historically white institutions. Right? Um, we get very unsettled. We, we prefer, for the most part, to see black and brown people as beneficiaries of our goodwill. But we don't like conversations that seem to empower them to be constituencies who can make demands upon us. Um, and that's what the history of slavery tends to suggest. And I think that's why we get uncomfortable with it. I don't think we're uncomfortable with what happened in the 17th and the 18th and the early 19th century. I think we're un uncomfortable with the potential consequences of that in the 21st century. Um, and that's precisely what... Uh, but I also think that's precisely why history is important. Right? It's because it allows us to say that very thing. You know, that it's, you know, why are we uncomfortable with this past and not all of those other historical narratives that we tell ourselves? And what is it about the present that leaves this past still, um, that leaves it sort of playing this disruptive and unsettling role? And it's precisely in that disruption that we actually find, or we at least can find the creative moment that leads us, in fact, to a more democratic conversation. Well, it's been fascinating listening to you speak tonight. I, I just, for one, I've really enjoyed the evening. I thank really you. I appreciate you. And I thank you for your time. Island. Yeah, thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Tom Murphy. And again, thank you for CBC for being our, <laughs> our broadcast for this evening, as well as other blog forms. And again, thank you to uh, Dr. Craig Stephen Walder for uh, holding it down for the questions <laughs> and the answers. <laughs> Pretty intense questions, but you have a lot of knowledge and expertise that showed us that you're the guy for leading the way for the next one, James. <laughs> and again, thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, before we conclude tonight, we invite you guys to a reception just on the upper level in the atrium. So again, thank you folks for coming out, and round of applause for Dr. Cre Dr. Steve Wilder and Tom Murphy.